What's going down, history people? Today we're going to take a look at our first national government, the Articles of Confederation. We're going to see how it failed, where it did have some success, and ultimately, why was it replaced by the new federal government under the Constitution. Now, before we get into any national governments, one thing you need to keep in mind is all of the 13 colonies upon independence had to create their own state governments. So each state is going to set up its own written plan of government under state constitution. And they're going to look very different depending upon which state you focus on. Now they do share some characteristics and one of those things is a separation of powers. Power was typically split between three branches of government. The legislative branch, executive branch, and the judicial branch. And most of the power in many of the states was in the legislative branch. They were worried about centralized power, especially in the executive branch, so no two powerful governors in these states. The whole idea of separation of powers was to safeguard the liberties that they are fighting for and eventually will win with the American Revolution. Some states had different property requirements. Um, these were typical for voter eligibility. In fact, many states maintained property qualifications in order to vote. In other words, if you were a white male, sorry, only white males are able to vote in the new nation. If you were a white male, you had to have property in order to be able to vote. So the American Revolution didn't change that reality in many states. Some states it did. Many states included Bill of Rights that outlined basic freedoms in the state constitution, so freedom of religion, trial by jury, and other rights that they were worried might be taken away by too powerful of a government. In fact, one state in particular, Virginia, created the Statue for Religious Freedom by Thomas Jefferson. This was passed by the Virginian Assembly, and it de-established the Church of England provided religious freedom for all, including Jews and Catholics, who typically were ignored when we talked about religious freedom. And Jefferson was very proud of this accomplishment way before the Bill of Rights or the First Amendment establishing religious freedom. Now, important to keep in mind is all these different state governments, no matter what their different rules were, they were set up based upon the idea of republicanism. And this meant power comes from the people and it's based upon consent. However, there would be debates over what republicanism would look like in the new nation. And as I said, some states maintain property qualifications for voting while others abolish them during the American Revolution. Our first national government is set up under the Articles of Confederation. This is the first national government of the United States. It's drafted by John Dickinson during the American Revolution. He actually submits it in 1777 during the fighting, but it took some time to ratify because the different states were disputing um, who controlled land out in the West. There was all sorts of arguments, and it's not formally ratified until 1781. Now, this government, it could conduct foreign policy, it could borrow money, it could make treaties. Sounds like a lot of power right there. However, it's extremely important to keep in mind under the Articles of Confederation, the government was weak. It had limited power, and they did that intentionally because of their experiences with King George and Parliament and their experiences with England in general. So some examples of the weaknesses, it had a unicameral Congress, unicameral meaning one house, only one house. There's no executive branch, no president, no prime minister. In fact, there's no court system. So no executive branch to enforce the laws. It has no power to tax. The Articles of Confederation gave the government no power to tax, and that's going to be a big problem. And it could not regulate trade between different states. Some other problems under the Articles of Confederation include it took nine votes out of 13 to pass laws. That means nine states out of 13, way more than a majority, needed to agree to pass any laws. All states, regardless of size, had one vote. So the most populated state, Virginia, had the same amount of representation as a smaller state such as Rhode Island. And if you want it to change the Articles of Confederation to amend it, all 13 states must agree in order to make any changes. And that's nearly impossible. Big thing that happens is under the Articles of Confederation, financial problems plagued the young nation. There was a large debt as a result of the American Revolution. Paper money was being printed and it was worthless. There's no ability to tax. 
and you had to rely on the states to just send money to the government and it's not going to work out very well. In spite of these challenges, there is some things the articles do well, and that's really seen in the Northwest Ordinances, one of the biggest accomplishments of the Articles of Confederation. The first one is the Land Ordinance of 1784, and it established the principle that territories could become states as their populations grew. And we're really talking about this territory right in here, the Old Northwest. And the U.S. government, under the Articles, would sell the land in order to raise money and pay off the debt. Under the Land Ordinance of 1785, it sets up a system for surveying the land and selling that land in the Northwest. So they would survey the land, as you could see right here. They would divide it up into townships. And an important part of the Ordinance of 1785 was that one section of the land would be set aside for public education. And this was a pretty progressive idea at the time for the government to be setting aside land for public ed. And then finally, the third law under the Northwest Ordinances is the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. This set up the system for territories to enter the Union as new states. And you could see the five states that will eventually be created out of this chunk of territory. It said once a territory reached 60,000 residents, they could petition to become a state. And they could become a state and they would be equal to the existing states. But under the Ordinance of 1787, they did something. They banned slavery north of the Ohio River in this territory. And this is obviously going to lead to further divisions between the North and the South as time goes on. In this early period, the United States is going to face many threats, many foreign policy problems from a variety of sources, and one is our old mama, England. In fact, England was building forts in this territory. Remember, they still occupied Canada. They're building forts in the old Northwest. They're supposed to remove those forts. They don't. There is disruptions in trade between the United States and England, and they're giving weapons to the Native Americans in this region, which is very often then being used on Americans in the frontier. So there's a lot of problems and tensions continuing between the U.S. and England. Another problem came from Spain when in 1784 they banned American shipping along the Mississippi River. They basically shut off the port of New Orleans right over here. And this is a huge problem because this is basically the highway that trade traveled on. And really, if you look at this map, roughly half of the territory of the United States was really not firmly in their control. We're also going to have some problems with our former allies, France. They start demanding repayment of loans that they had given us during the American Revolution, and eventually they're going to have their own revolution, the French Revolution, which is going to cause a lot of problems later on. And then lastly, you'll never believe it, but pirates also were causing problems for the United States in this early period. The Barbary pirates were over here in North Africa in the Mediterranean Sea and in this area and they start harassing American shipping. Previous to this period we had the protection of the powerful British Navy since they're our mama and now that we're free we have to do our fighting on our own and we're not equipped to deal with these multiple threats. So you have all these foreign policy problems for the young nation then you have threats from within, and that really could be seen with Shays Rebellion. Recall, following the American Revolution, the economy suffered a post-war depression. The economy is doing really poorly, the money's worth nothing, and particularly hard hit were farmers. Since the Articles of Confederation can't tax, the debt is growing, and many states are printing paper money that is basically worthless. As a result of these problems, you have something called Shea's Rebellion sparking in 1786. And Daniel Shea, the guy who the rebellion is named after, is a veteran of the American Revolution, and he's a farmer in Massachusetts. And he leads a rebellion of poor farmers in the state of Massachusetts. Many of these farmers were seeing their farms foreclosed, they were taken over by the bank, and in order to deal with this, they start organizing. They have some demands, they want lower taxes, they want the end of foreclosures, they don't want their farms taking over, they want the printing of paper money so that they can help pay their debts off easier, and they also want the end of imprisonment 
for debt. You could actually go to jail if you didn't pay your bills back then. These farmers don't get their demands met and they begin to organize into mobs that stop the collection of taxes. They start closing down the courts where the debtors were being put on trial. And there's even a mob of farmers that try to seize the weapons from the armory where all the guns are kept. Now here's the thing about Shays' Rebellion. The government under the Articles of Confederation was too weak to put the rebellion down. So these farmers are not paying their taxes. They're shutting down the court systems. And the government really can't put this rebellion down. And you can see it's happening throughout the state of Massachusetts. Eventually, a militia breaks up the rebellion, and Shay's rebellion kind of fades away. But what's important about this, and make sure you know it, it increased calls for a stronger central government. There's a real fear amongst the propertied classes, the moneyed, that this rebellion is a sign of things to come, and we need a strong government to deal with these potential rebellions. Another important thing about Shays' Rebellion is it reveals tensions between those people in the backcountry, those people out in the frontier, and the people that are on the East Coast, the more wealthy, the more property, the more moneyed. Following Shays' Rebellion, some people wanted a new government to be formed, and there was a growing demand that something be done to address the problems facing the nation under the Articles of Confederation. And you can see in the blue some of the things we've already mentioned. There is a meeting in 1786 at Annapolis. It's called the Annapolis Convention. Only five states attend to discuss trade and commerce. It's not a really successful meeting in terms of accomplishing anything, but two people at the meeting, Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, agree we're going to meet up again in Philadelphia in one year. And that's exactly what they do, and this event becomes the Constitutional Convention in 1787. The purpose of the meeting was for revising the articles. In fact, the 55 delegates who go, they're sent for the sole and express purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. They're going there with the plan that we're going to fix this thing and make it a little bit better. 12 states show up at the Constitutional Convention. No Rhode Island. You got some all-stars. You can see them in that painting. You got George Washington. He's the president of the convention. Ben Franklin's in the house at 81 years old. And you got a whole bunch of other people. And what they decide, these 55 delegates, they very quickly decided to create an entirely new, stronger central government. They're going to get rid of the Articles of Confederation and replace it with a new federal government. Interesting to note who's not there. Thomas Jefferson is over in Europe, so is John Adams. And some of the more radical members of the American Revolution, Patrick Henry, Sam Adams, they are suspicious of this group, and they're really worried about the formation of a more powerful government but they're doing it anyhow, and so here's what happens. They do need to make a lot of compromises at the Constitutional Convention. There's a lot of disagreements. Make sure you know about them, and the biggie is about representation in Congress. How are they going to determine the number of people who are elected into Congress per state? And there's a lot riding on this decision because the more votes, the more power. Remember, under the Articles, every state had one vote, regardless of size. And you can see on the map, you got 13 states, and they have wildly different levels of population. James Madison introduced his plan called the Virginia Plan, oftentimes kind of referred to as the Large State Plan. And this said we should set up a bicameral, two-house legislator, and representation would be based on population, meaning the more people you have living in the state, the more people you would get that would be able to serve in Congress. Clearly, if you're a small state, you don't like this plan, and they had their own plan, sometimes referred to as the New Jersey plan, and this was favored by small states. They say, let's have a unicameral legislator, one house, and each state would have equal representation. There's a lot of tension over this issue, but luckily there's a compromise. It's called the Great Compromise, introduced by Roger Sherman, sometimes referred to as the Connecticut Plan. And here's what they do. They're going to take elements of both plans. You're going to have a bicameral legislator, so you're going to have a two-house. The upper house, the Senate, two representatives per state. So it didn't matter how big or small your state was, you're going to get two senators. And in the lower house, the House of Representatives, the representation would be based upon population. So the more people living in the state, 
the more people you get to elect. While they solved the population issue, another issue kind of hovered over the Constitutional Convention, and that has to do with slavery. There was a debate over whether slaves should be counted in the state population. And Southerners said, yes, you should count our slaves so we can get more representatives. Northerners say, no, you don't give them any political or social or economic rights, so the answer is no. They come up with a very controversial compromise called the Three-Fifths Compromise, and basically what it said, slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person when deciding representation in the House of Reps. So each slave would count as three-fifths, and by doing so, this adds more representatives in the House of Reps for southern states, which tended to have large slave populations. Another agreement surrounding the issue of slavery has to do with the slave trade. How much longer should we allow people to be forcibly brought to this new nation founded upon liberty and freedom and all that good stuff? And at the convention, they decide they're going to allow the slave trade to continue until 1808. And for another 20 years, slaves are allowed to be brought into the United States. And then finally, Although the word slave or slavery was not used in the Constitution, it's important to note the institution of slavery was very much protected by the original document. They even have a fugitive slave clause which is added which says if your slave runs away, you are able to reacquire your property and bring them back to your plantation or farm. There's other debates and conflicts at the Constitutional Convention, but eventually they create a document and they have to figure out whether or not we're going to ratify or approve it. The Constitution would only take effect if 9 out of 13 states ratified it, and there are going to be supporters and haters on both sides. The Federalists were those individuals who were the supporters of the Constitution, and they really favored a strong central government. On the other end were the Anti-Federalists, people like Thomas Jefferson, even though he was over in Europe. These were the critics of the Constitution, and they favored a weak central government. Yes, there were flaws with the Articles of Confederation, but this new government in their mind was giving too much power to the central government. And anti-federalists were very much opposed to ratification. They tended to favor state rights. You do have people trying to convince those who did not want ratification, and you could see this in the Federalist Papers. These are 85 essays, largely written by James Madison and Hamilton, but you also got some by John Jay, and they were designed to persuade people to support ratification of the Constitution. Eventually, the thing that helps get enough anti-federalists to support ratification is the guarantee of a Bill of Rights that would be added to the Constitution. The first ten amendments would be added later on, and the idea behind the Bill of Rights is it enumerated, it spelled out specifically, individual rights and explicitly restricted powers of the federal government. And the new government will take effect in 1789 when George Washington takes office as the nation's first president. Finally, some stuff you should know about the Constitution. The Constitution set up a government based upon popular sovereignty, and this means power is in the hands of the people. They are the source of a government's power. Separation of powers between the three branches of government is very much a part of this constitutional system, and it's important to note that the power of government is limited, and there are checks and balances and a separation of powers embedded in this document. Another concept you should know about is the fact that the Constitution set up a division of power between the national and state governments. Both the national and state governments have powers, and this is the system known as federalism. But it's also important to note that the federal government, the national government, ultimately has supremacy over the states. Ratification meant the Constitution would be the supreme law of the land, and lastly, under the Constitution, presidents would not be elected directly by the voters. In fact, the framers of the Constitution wanted to limit excessive popular influence. They feared too much democracy would lead to mob rule. Remember, these were men of property and money, so they created the Electoral College as the means of electing the President of the United States. That's going to do it. Thank you for watching. If you learned some stuff, click like on the video. If you haven't already done so, subscribe. Any questions, post them in the comment section. And make sure you check out our website. Have a beautiful day. Peace.